Let's turn into the Word, 1 Peter chapter 4. First Peter chapter 4, we're going to start with verses 1 and 2. So we're breaking in, I think this is like uh, part 4 in this series, so I'm going to try to recap here just in a second, try to do a two-minute recap as best as I can, then I'm going to hit some new ground today. So if some things don't link up, you can always go back and watch the video, because we've got all these recorded. Just go to redemptionmobile.org, go to the Watch tab, scroll down, it'll say YouTube, Punch it, it'll take you right there so you can get caught up with us, so you can understand what's going on. Because when I have series, I always build line upon line, precept upon precept. So what you're hearing now is, is a uh, culmination of three messages that we've already preached. So <clears throat> go get caught up with us, and some of it will make perfect sense to you once you go back and watch it. First Peter chapter 4. Starting with verse 1, For as much then as Christ hath delivered us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. Father, thank you for the reading of your word. Thank you as we try to quickly recap and get to some new material. Holy Spirit, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for allowing us to be in the presence of our almighty God. Lord Jesus, you did the work. You paid the price. We glorify you and we thank you for being the mediator between us and the Father. In the name of Jesus, and everybody said, Amen. Amen. So we're learning separation anxiety is the name of this series. And separation anxiety is just a state of distress felt from being separated from familiar. Because separation from familiar is suffering in the flesh. Nobody wants to be torn from something that you like or that you're familiar with or that you're used to. And the, but the only part that has life in it in anything is a seed, and that's the only part that God wants. But the seed is always at the core, which means there's always an outer encasing. And we've learned that the, our outer encasing is our flesh. And so through separation anxiety, we're trying to separate ourselves from the flesh because separation is sanctification. Amen. So when you're separate from something, you're being sanctified. And it's not easy to do with your flesh. But you'll never be successful if you don't get separated. The God will peel you for the purpose of planting you. But He can't plant everything else. He's only interested in that part that's got life that He wants to plant. And that's the seed that He has planted inside of you. And we learned that threshing is the means by which we separate what's not desired from what is. It's a violent act and it seems harsh, but it's what brings life. And it's what brings growth. We also learned that there's a suffering in separation, but there's also a great reward. Everybody wants the multiplication, but not everybody wants to go through the threshing process to get to that grain of wheat that Jesus talked about. Unless a grain of wheat die, it biteth alone. But if it dies, in other words, when we die to ourself, when we allow that threshing process for God to get to what He wants to get and then allow Him to plant it, whew, then there will be no abiding alone. And last week we learned that you bring order to chaos by separation. You can't pray it out, you can't wish it out, you can't counsel it out, you can't reason it out. The only way to bring order to chaos is by separation. Amen. Now we're called up to number four today. Hallelujah. As we even already stated uh, in the offering, scripture that we had in the offering, how do you get more seed? How do you get more seed? Everybody wants more seed. But to get more seed, you sow more seed. Remember that God 
that any man can count the seeds in an apple, but only God can count how many apples are in a seed. And if you want seed, you've got to plant seed. But that one seed that you plant will multiply many more seeds. Amen. Are y'all here today? And in 2 Corinthians 9, 10, it says, He that ministers seed to the sower, or he that gives, distributes seed to the sower. In other words, who's the one that's getting more seed? The one that's sowing more seed. It's a biblical principle that the Lord likes givers. He doesn't like takers. That the Lord likes those that, you even see it in Matthew 25, real strongly. We had one that had five, one that had two, and one that had one. The one that had five worked it, did something with it, got it multiplied, said, good job, good and faithful servant. One that got two, he did something with it, got two more, good and faithful servant. Then he got to the one. I only got one, Lord. Oh, God, I only got one. Well, the one that only had one didn't do nothing with it. He belly ate, moaned and groaned. And the Lord said, that wicked servant, you ain't done nothing with nothing. Take what you have. Are you hearing me? Because the Lord wants us to bear much fruit. He's in the, he commanded the man to be fruitful and multiply. That hasn't changed. That hasn't changed. He wants us to be fruitful and multiply. And the one that only had the one, can you just imagine, I can just see it on NBC, uh, MSNBC and CNN and CBS and ABC. I can just see him sticking a microphone in Jesus' face and saying, how dare you? Who do you think you are coming over here and giving the one that only has one and taking it away from them and giving it to the one that's got ten? Are you out of your mind? Seriously, what kind of person are you? What kind of heart do you have? How dare you even take the one little one that they only got it and give it away? And it's not that you didn't give it away to somebody who didn't have much. You happened to give it away to the one that had ten. See, this world system doesn't operate in the kingdom system. This world is surrounded by the Babylonian system, which means the Babylonian system is... It just states that we can meet our own needs without God. And they operate in this system. But God's system says, if I've given you something, I expect something from it. I don't expect any more than what I have given you. And if you can't do nothing with five loaves and two fish, just put it back in my hands. I'll multiply it. And so he expects. He expects the seed to multiply. And He's putting time and energy and, and wealth and His Spirit in our lives, giving us His Word, giving us this filling us full of seeds that we would be able to cast those seeds and sow those seeds. We, we mentioned this in another series that we don't have the right to withhold His seed that He's told us to sow. Amen. Now, it's not your own responsibility on what happens after you sow it, but it is your responsibility to sow it. Notice where it didn't say He who gives... Seed, it says, he who gives seed to the sower. You're to scatter it. You're to scatter God's seed. Scatter it in the break room. Scatter it, amen. Even when somebody wants to tell you you're number one on Airport Boulevard and honks at you. Still, scatter that seed, amen. Scatter it. Scatter that seed. Because it's his seed. Amen. And we learned last week also that we are God's seed. That's Matthew 13, 38 for those taking notes. Matthew 13, 38. He goes through the parable and he says that the seeds, the good seeds that were sown, the good seeds, that good seeds. God don't have any halfway clearance, dent and dean section. Good seed. It says, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, Matthew 13, 38. So it's not only a lot of work to get the seed in the ground. We discussed that in some, on the Good Ground series. We went through that series and talked about that. But it's also a lot of work to harvest the crop. Matter of fact, in Hebrews 4, 11, let's turn there real quick. Hebrews 4, 11. It almost seems like an oxymoron. 
Because Hebrews 4.11 says, Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. How in the world do you rest but yet labor? <laughs> Amen. God is so good. In other words, that's that separation from the flesh that we've been talking about, that separation anxiety. How can you let go and let God? Just letting go and letting God. Sometimes we have our hands on it so much, we want it done our way. We think that sometimes, sometimes we treat him like he's the Burger King, not the King of Kings. Because you look at him and say, I want it my way right away. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But yet it's his seed, and he's telling us to labor. If you're going to labor, labor to enter into, labor to trust me. Now, don't get this wrong. He ain't saying you ain't got a part to play. He's not saying that you don't have a responsibility. He's not saying that he's not going to tell you what to do because those that are willing and obedient will eat the good of the land. So you've got to be obedient. What does obedient mean? That means you've got to do something. It's not just, a, it's not just an agreement. You, it's, uh, obedience is not just agreeing with God. Obedience is doing what he said. But when we labor, we labor to enter into his rest because harvest doesn't wait on you. I've worked a farm, and I know that the hardest part about farming is the beginning and the end. We've already went through the cultivating and what it takes and when it's, the ground's cold and it's hard and it just, it's nothing easy. And then you lay into that tractor and, and it's early spring, especially where I'm from in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina, and that ground is hard and you just see the smoke coming out of a tractor because it's struggling to try to plow through that stuff. And we planted tobaccos. That was the crop of choice where, where I was from. The harvest does not wait on you. And when people think about harvest, I don't want to get too sidetracked, but when people think about, oh, Lord, my harvest, bring me my harvest, somehow I know that they, they ain't farm because they have the idea that all of a sudden stuff is growing in that field is just going to automatically, miraculously just end up in that barn. And we don't know how it happened, but it got there. See, this is a process that when harvest comes, you have got to reap it and you have got to put it in the barn. You, you got to. God will give you the seed. You didn't create the seed. God gave you the seed. You have to plant the seed, take care of the seed. God will take care of watering it and letting the rain fall down and everything else. And that it was said some sow some water, but God gives the increase. See, he's a part of it every step of the way. Amen. Amen. See, he, he, you can't do his part, and he won't do yours. You can't make that seed grow. That's in its DNA that he created it. But that seed ain't going to grow unless you plant it. Amen. And harvest will not wait on you, because harvest does not check with your calendar for an appropriate time. Did you hear me? If you've worked farming, you know that once it's ripe, once it's ready to go, you've got to do it. It doesn't matter how cold it gets, how hot it gets, how dry it gets, how rainy it gets. It doesn't matter that if all the social stuff and your activity and your life you want to do, you've got to just put it on hold because the harvest is not going to wait for anything else. If the crop is not harvested when it's ready, then it will simply waste away. Listen, and be unusable. Unusable. This is sad because I have seen this in people's lives too. How sad to invest so much time on something in which you yield no return. All previous efforts in the cycle would then be in vain, wasted. I've seen it. I've seen people go through the go-through and they've put forth the effort and they put through the time and they put through the energy. And yeah, they don't have a multiplication of fruit yet, but you can see something is growing and it's starting and it's already took root and it's doing its thing. And then it gets a little harder of the process and then they just quit and give up. What a shame. You've wasted all that. The whole reason you even did it is so you can get a harvest off of that fruit. You've just wasted your life in vain. Not trying to get the fruit that is wanting to... And it's, and it's happening. But you gave up on it too soon. 
And as we've talked about, it's the, the, the prize is not the fruit in of itself. The prize is the seeds that are in the fruit because once you get all that fruit, you've got all that more, more seed. Amen. That's how you multiply in your life. That's the system that God created. Let's talk about some of these things. Let's look at different stages of success and the separation needed in each step. It seems like I'm starting from the end, but actually I'm starting in the beginning if you're going to follow me. Let's talk about harvest some more. The season when mature crops are gathered up, or it called, call it reaping. At harvest, listen, you're separated from your former source. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 5 and 13, excuse me. 1 13. Who has delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Because when you get harvested, we've been talking about wheat and a wheat harvest. When you're harvested, a sickle comes down and it goes. And what happens is that the world you used to live in, now you're getting translated out of that environment, out of that source, out of that soil, everything else that you had been in all your life. There's fruits of unrighteousness. And God says, no, no, no. You got to go, go, go. We got to get you out of here. That when you give your life to the Lord, you're translated out of one kingdom into another kingdom. In other words, you're not a product of your environment anymore. And we've talked about this before, but I'm going to say it again because it's so good. That whatever you were birthed in is what sustains you. That's a principle and a law. That a fish is born in the water. Take it out of the water and it... A plant is planted in the ground. Take it out of the ground and it... So the, so the environment that you were birthed in is the environment that you were sustained in. Amen. And that when you are born again of God, let's bring it into the spiritual now, when you are born of God, God takes you and whoosh, reaps you out of the kingdom of darkness and now translates you into the kingdom of His dear Son. And the only way for you to sustain and be survive is you've got to stay in the, your source. The source that will sustain you is the environment that birthed you in. So if you step out of Christ, you start to die. Woo-wee! Preach it, preacher. And so that's the harvesting that we're going to start with. You are reaped out of one kingdom. But once you're reaped, it's what we call sheaving. What is sheaving? That means to gather or bind into a sheaf, a bundle of wheat bound after reaping. So when you get all this wheat that you've just cut up and then all of a sudden you take a bunch of them together and you tie it up in little, little bushels called sheaving. The harvest is you're separated from your former source, but in the sheaving, you're separated, listen, into a new environment. Being, listen, being full of potential, but also being full of weight and sinful proclivities. Let's go to Hebrews 12, 1. And Hebrews 12, 1. Wherefore, seeing that we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us, let us, let who? Who's going to do it? You're going to do it. Let us. <laughs> Lord, take it away. Take it away, Lord. Nope, that's not Scripture. Let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so does easily beset us and let us run the weight race with patience. Run with patience the race that is set before us. 
lay, let us lay aside every weight. In other words, you're out of one kingdom, but the kingdom that you come out of is not fully out of you. Because once again, what's the Lord after? He reaped you out of one kingdom, planted you in the other kingdom, but in the sheathing process, you got bundled up. You're no longer planted in that environment. You're now bundled up. You're away from that. But you know what you still got around you? You still got a bunch of chaff around you. You've got some stalks around you. And, that's, and the, the stalk and the chaff is not going to produce anything. Has no life in it. Has no life in it. And so even though you're out of one, there's still a lot of what you're out of still in you. Amen. It was easy for God to get the children of Israel out of Egypt, but very, very difficult to get Egypt out of the children of Israel. It's easy for God to take a bitter woman out of an old house and put her in a new house, but it's going to be hard to get the bitterness out of the woman that's in the new house. I've heard this too uh, from ministering to years. You know, same thing with Egypt. It, it's hard sometimes doing ministry. when Listen, when you go down in the trenches and you go, because God said go to the highways and hedges too. Come on now. Yeah. You don't just go to the gated communities and ask permission to hand out flyers. Come on. That were the kind of ministry that we've done for years. Sometimes when there's a big move of the Holy Ghost it's, and God's moving, and he does what only God can do. You can, you, can, you can pull the young man out of the hood, but sometimes it's hard to get the hood out of him. And that's where the discipleship comes in. He didn't say to go make converts, to go make disciples. That's hard. That's not easy. Lord Jesus, and he's called us to us, and sometimes I feel like quitting on it because it's hard. Amen. But he didn't give on, uh, up on us. Amen. Amen. And I was a hard cookie to, to crack also. That takes time. That's a process. Why? Because even though Lazarus come forth and he's resurrected unto a new life, Jesus says, you loose him and let him go. You take the grave clothes off of him. Amen. Take the, it's a process. Yeah, he's coming out of the tomb, but he's coming out like a stiff mummy. He's got stuff still attached to him. That's like being harvested and even though that precious grain is in the wheat it's still got this husk and it's still got stems and chaff all around it and it can't be planted like that so we go to threshing that's separating the grain or the seed from the husks or the chaff God wants the seed he doesn't want the chaff he doesn't want the straw and so what happens, he separates it by beating and trampling. Now, we've discussed this over and over again, too, and I can't go back and reteach it. I don't want your theology to be totally upended, but sometimes we need our theology upended, amen? Is that God does not bring a hammer down on you to crush you in life just for the pure sake to crush you. That God gives us his word. His word is corrective, not punitive. And as we read as our main scripture in Peter, there is suffering in this process. Why? Because there's suffering and separation. I don't want to leave the chaff. I've been in the chaff all my life. Man, I've been running with chaff all my life. Chaff always got my back ever since I can remember. I look around, there's a chaff. Chaff ain't left me. But yet God says the only thing that has life in it is that seed. And I can't plant that seed until it's separated. So when you separate from familiar, there's a suffering involved. I can remember when the Lord told me that I, them marble lights got to go, bro. And it wasn't easy. I'd like to tell you that I just tossed them in the trash can and it was just, you know. That's it. There was a suffering involved because they called my name. Mm -hmm. Every time I'd finish a meal, they'd call my name. Every time I was bored and didn't have nothing to do and I had to wait 10 minutes somewhere somehow, they'd call my name. Amen. 
but by the power of the Holy Ghost, knowing that you're in a process, knowing that there is a plan for you. I can remember Bishop T.D. Jakes talking about this, that his spiritual father, he used to smoke. Don't suck all the air out of the room, all right? None of us are perfect, and all of us have a story. We all have a B.C. And so Bishop Jakes is there. Listen, knowing it is, is he ever could be, preaching in a little storefront in West Virginia. Matter of fact, when, even when he did start getting recognition, everybody was driving through and passing right by his church trying to find it because the way he preached and the anointing on his life, everybody expected he'd have this big, immaculate, nice church like he's got now. But yet it was a, just a little bitty storefront and everybody would pass by because they wouldn't, they wouldn't even looking in that direction. That's a whole message in and of itself, not despising some things just because it don't look like. Like how many times have you guys heard the story that the best restaurant tells town is a little hole in the wall? What if the, one of the greatest anointings that the Lord wants to have in this nation happens to start at a little hole in the wall? It did, and he did. And he, one of his spiritual mentors knew he smoked, but he never really would say nothing to him. One day he come around the corner, and Bishop Jake saw him come around the corner, so he drops the butt, steps on it, does like that, you know, just try to act cool. And his mentor come up to him, bent down, picked it up and said, such, so, such a shame that something so small can get in the way of a destiny so big. And just dropped it, walked off, that's all he said. But he got it, he understood it. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so God will bring things in our life to separate us in that threshing process. It hurts and it's painful, but it's for the purpose of sanctification because separation is sanctification. He's trying to set you apart so he can sow you. And so then the winnowing comes in. Well, let's go back to the threshing real quick because i got scripture for that. See, you're separated from your comfort zone in the threshing is basically what God's doing. No, God's not going to come down and smite you with some disease. That's kill, steal, and destroy, which is the thief, which is the devil. That's his job. Listen, God never changes jobs, and he doesn't work in partnership with the enemy. Amen. Okay? Amen. God's a good God. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Amen. If it steals and kills and destroys, it's the enemy. Amen. Some people get this, once again, they get this theology confused and they get this big area. There's no gray area. If it still kills and destroys, it's the enemy. But if it's separating you for the purpose of your future, and you have to give a little this up or a little that up, and as we learned a few weeks ago too, sometimes it's not as much as what you're striving towards that's the hardest part, that all successful people also have to let go. Sometimes the hardest part is letting go of something, not reaching for it. Because every person that's ever done anything in life, at all the substantial, it's not about just spending all their time and putting their hand to something diligently and faithfully as much as it's not about what they're reaching to, but it's about what they let go of. Because you can't reach forward and also hold back. God says no. you got, you got to make a choice. Because if you're lukewarm, what happens? Spew you out of his mouth. Amen. Because he's worthy. He's worthy of your all. And he's doing it for your benefit too. <laughs> See, it's not just for his name and glory, which that is the main thing. But you know what? You get in on it. You get in on it. Because he has your best interest in mind. Have you ever thought that he cares just as much about you as your ministry? Hello? So he's got it all figured out. You got to go with the flow, Joe. Get on the plan, man. And in Romans 12, 1. Romans 12, 1, it says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you, pre that you present your bodies a what? A living sacrifice. Sounds a lot like threshing to me. Sounds like being separated from your own comfort zone to me. The hardest part about a living sacrifice is it's always wanting to crawl off the altar. And that's the hardest part. It's not that it's hard for God to do anything. It's hard for us to decide that we're going to stay on the altar. What's the song that I'll... Uh, the, the, this song that you provide the fire, I'll provide the sacrifice that we love to sing in here so much? Derivative from that verse right there. God always answers His 
sacrifices by fire. We see that in Scripture. He'll provide the fire, but you've got to provide the sacrifice. Separated from your comfort zone. Then after threshing, we're going to winnow a little bit. Winnowing is separating the grain, the seed, from the chaff. Now that you've gotten a lot of the big stuff out of your life, there's still some stuff that's not what he wants. But there's just little pieces here and little pieces there. So it's not like you can just go up and grab it and just go with it. But all he wants is that seed. He wants the grain. He does not want the chaff. The chaff is, listen, chaff is worthless, has no value. Isn't it amazing how God is trying to separate us from things that have no value to us or to him or anybody else? I think it's amazing how we hold on to something that's absolutely valueless. There's never in any place in Scripture where chaff was ever considered valuable. You, you, I don't, I, you know, maybe you have. I've read the Bible through before, but that doesn't mean I've missed a few things. Amen. I, but I don't remember reading anything where somebody brought a bushel of chaff to the market. Why is it that we will hold on to something that we think is precious, but in reality it's valueless? It's worthless. Well, amen. Winnowing. You're, the grain is separated from the chaff. You're separated, listen, from where you think you are to your actual location that's real and weighty and what's phony and what's light. Let's go to, back to 1 Peter chapter 4. So once again, in every process, there's separating going on. Let me recap real quick. In the harvest, well, being born again, you're separated from the kingdom you used to be. In sheaving, you're separated from, into a new environment. When threshing, you're separated from your comfort zone. And in winnowing, you're separated from where you think you are. You're separated, basically, the, the weighty and the real from the phony and the worthless. 12 says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. Let's go back to chapter 1. Think it not strange, the fiery trial, because there's separation going on. Let's see, which verse was that? Verse 7. 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith, that fiery trial, the trial of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes. See, chaff is worthless. I'm going to tie this up right here. Why is he comparing faith with gold? Because faith is what? I mean, gold is what? Gold is valuable. People have died over gold. Nation has fought nation over gold. These men fought over gold just as much as they fought over women. Amen? Amen. Amen. Why is gold so valuable? What makes anything so valuable? It's rarity. Gold, you get it out of the ground just like you do a piece of gravel. They're both rocks, aren't they? Why is a handful of rock not worth a thousand bucks? But I got me a good gold nugget and I get a thousand bucks out of it. Because of its rarity, you can find a piece of gravel anywhere. You have to mine for gold. You have to search diligently for gold. Gold is just not everywhere. And so that is with our faith. That's why he compares faith with gold, because I got some news for you. Real faith? Not just, you, not just you reading something, not just you saying something, but real faith, not just what you confess out of your mouth, but what you really believe in your heart. True faith is valuable because true faith is rare. Amen. That's why you can have 100 people in a room, 99 of them lay hands on somebody, nothing happened, but that one comes along and all of a sudden, fever broke. Woo! 
Jesus I'm preaching. Real faith, real faith is rare. That's why it's so valuable. Lord have mercy. And in the winnowing process, we're separating what's real from what's phony. What is very valuable from what don't. I, you know what? You can have all the chaff in the world, but it won't produce anything. Lord Jesus, you can just hold on to one precious seed and start being able to multiply in your life. And I'm going, I think I'm going to end on this. Planting. Once... You're mature enough to produce. Did you hear that? You've taken out of one kingdom. You're separated from that kingdom. You're separated from your mess. So God can get a message out of your mess. You got all the fluff and stuff out of your life. You're starting to look more and more like Christ. I know, that, I know people don't like to hear this, but it's true, and you can back it up biblically, that, you know, I want to be used by God. Well, He'll use you when you become more usable. But just as soon as it comes to plucking you up from here and separating you from there, and you bucking and fighting and everything else, He'll sit around and wait. And if you want to waste all your life hanging on to chaff, you can go ahead. Hang on to chaff. When the whole time the Lord just says, just, just, just give me some time. Let me work on you. Be obedient. Let me work this thing out. And when you get mature enough to reproduce, amen, planning will happen. The Lord has got to the only part that has life in it, and He wants it multiplied. In other words, we said we were born of incorruptible seed. The Word of God indwells in us, and we are children of the Most High God. We are produced... Everything produces after its kind, and you're produced after God, so you're the God kind. Amen. But you've got all this stuff around you that he's trying to peel away because he can't plant all the rest of it. He's got to peel it away to get to what he can plant. Because what he planted in you, he wants to plant. Amen. Amen. The Lord wants to separate you for the purpose of your purpose. Well, Lord, I want this to happen in my life. Well, you won't let him get down to precious seed so he can plant you there. God will plant you once you become mature enough to be planted. And here's the thing. I know this might not be the most popular message. I wish I had an organ player here. Amen. Hey, glory to God. Pray for me. I'd love to have one. It might not be a thousand people here this morning. I might not just be telling you God loves you and just encouraging you. Listen, this is vital because this is the kinds of message that usually goes in one ear and goes out the other, but it's the kind of message that if you get a hold of it, listen, this is if you get a hold of these principles, you can determine your outcome in life. God already ordained it. You can determine your outlook in life. Yes, this might not be the cheerleading, pump up, we all hurrah, feel good, but this is the meaty stuff that will get you from point A to point B every time. And what the devil is scared of, he ain't scared of your shout. He, what he's scared of is he's scared of that you get a hold of a principle that God has in his word and you act upon it according to that word and you see the results of that come out in your life he's scared of that because he says i can't i ain't nothing i can do about it now in that area of their life i can't stop it i can't stop god i can't stop the word i can't stop the holy spirit i can't stop the anointing on that and they're doing it right and there's nothing i can do about it now every time i try to thwart it it won't do no good every time i give them want them to back up they keep going forward every time i try to discourage them they just get encouraged i can't stop it that's what he's scared of because once you operate according to God's word, the way God's word tells you to, and listen, it's not a fluke. It's not like, well, gosh, I'll, well, well, we'll give God praise for that. Well, how did it happen? Well, I don't know God. Once you can say, yeah, it was God. Yeah, it was his power and his mercy. But let me tell you what his word said. And you know the formula by which you reach to that point. The devil is afraid of that. He can't stop you. Amen. Amen. Glory wants to plant you for the purpose of your purpose. Let's look at Acts 13 too. 
I'll camp on that, and then we're going to shut her down. Acts 13, 2. We forget that there's a process long before there's a planning. Everybody wants to be planted, but you've got to go through the process of separation before you can be planted. And in Acts 13, 2, here Paul is, and Paul's already seen the Lord on the Damascus Road. Paul's already went out into Arabia to spend one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus to get it right from the source. Paul's already worked with uh, the uh, Jer Jerusalem Council a little bit and met the apostles, and he's already been preaching in Antioch and, and these other places. Paul's been at this for 13 years. Look at your neighbor and say, 13. 13. Say, no, he didn't say that. Look at him again and say, 13. 13. I know we don't like to hear that. We all want a Damascus Road experience, see the Lord as a bright light, and then next week things just start working itself out. We start seeing a little something, something. But here Paul has been working it as faithfully as he can, as much as he can, not having a clue with everything that God wants to do with him. And in 13, 2, it says, As they ministered to the Lord the, and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, What did he say? What does your Bible say? Separate. 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 Me, Barnabas, and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. All that separation is for the purpose of your purpose. This is hard. Listen, this is hard because, listen, it's not just leaving the crazy, cray cray, all jacked up, sinful, self destructive lifestyle or negative, pessimistic, unbelieving, and rebellious people that you know that you need to detach from in life anyways. That's logical. That's, you can understand that. That would be easy. But it's hard to leave the loving, kind, and caring people who helped you get to where you are, but they aren't called to do or to go in the same direction that you are. You see, with most people, remember I talked to you, earlier about it's just wasted the harvest comes but you don't do nothing with it and it's just like why this is i see this more than anything i've seen people come out of disasters hard times and situations and it's easy to live it's easy not to talk to pookie on the corner no more that's a giver you crazy you always been crazy i ain't talking to you no more it's easy to watch who you run with when you know that they, they up to no good Amen. Amen. But it's hard when separation now comes from those that you do care about, that aren't all jacked up, that have been praying for you for years, that still love you and believe in you. You've spent time with them, they've spent time with you. But your harvest is hanging and there's a window of opportunity. Well, God gives you second chances, third chances. Yes, He does. He's a merciful God. But let me tell you something. Sometimes some opportunities are not coming back around again. That does not mean that God... Listen, the giftings and calling of God are without repentance. There'll always be a call. There'll always be a gift. And God will always use you and He can move you. But certain opportunities only come around once in a lifetime. If you don't believe me... Ask that to Esau because the lineup should have been Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. But Esau did not care about the eternal things that had weight. He thought about himself and he lived for the moment. And anytime you make temporary decisions based on your feelings that have lasting consequences, the feelings go, but you have to live with the consequences. Amen. Never make long-term decisions on short-term feelings. He was hungry, and he sold his birthright. He sold the valuable thing that he had, and he sold it for a cup of soup. And I've seen so many men follow this way too. God's got them, they're doing good, and all of a sudden... She comes up, look good. She got lips, she got hips, and everything else. 
and will sell a destiny for a magical moment. Well, that magical moment is gone, but now your destiny is gone too. And you have to live with the consequences. Oh, yeah, she was all that in a bag of chips, so I had one too many, and we, we, we did. We went to Vegas and got married. Now you've tied your finances. You've tied your family. You've tied your career. You've tied your destiny. You've, tried, you've tied the deed to your house. You've, you've tied the deed to your car. You've tied all of that to a feeling that's fleeting, that God has entrusted with you to manage and steward. Hallelujah. And so, the hardest part of the separation is separating from those that we do love, that do care for us. But it's not the direction that the God has. So you have to make a decision. Am I going to go with them or am I going with God? See, this is where rubber beats the road. Don't you think for one minute that God won't put you in that situation. If God told Abraham to raise a knife on his son, don't you think that maybe God has a plan for you and he's wanting to see if you're going to leave Big Mama? Are you going to follow God or are you going to follow family? And not only with Esau, not only did Esau lose this opportunity, but also it should have been the seed of Saul that the Messiah came through. Because God told Saul, I'll establish your throne forever. Just follow me, my ways, my ordinances, my statutes, and I'll make sure that your seed is on the throne. But the lineage of Jesus is not through the lineage of Saul, is it? Because he, amen, he is the seed of David. Because Saul decided to be rebellious and disobedience twice. Yeah. And I got a third witness for you in the same vein. You just read so many chapters over with when, when Judah and Israel, when Israel split into Judah and, and Israel, the southern and the northern tribe, God looked at Jeroboam, the one that he was going to put to be king over the northern tribe. And he said, you do what you're supposed to, you follow me. You follow me, and I'll make sure all your descendants sit on the throne. And what did he do? He blew it. And if you look, there's hardly anybody who's anybody's child in Israel. It's just, there's just one killing after another. One person would be king, somebody kill him. Then their child would be king, then they'd kill him. It's just nothing but murder and everything else. Different families, different lineages on the throne. But even though Judah was all jacked up too, every one of them that sat on the throne in Judah, though, was a seat of David. I can't got time to touch that. A kid grew up. Kids grow up and have to move across country to be planted in the environment the Lord wants to bring the kingdom to. That's hard separation. I know this generation don't understand it. For some reason, kids think that they can be 35-year-old and still live in mama's house, and it's all right. There's nothing right, all right about that, and even nature teaches this itself, that when that eaglet gets old enough to fly, you got to go. <laughs> Amen. That's healthy. That's good. That's, not, that's, that's, that's good. That's growing somebody up. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. It's not getting rid of you. It's growing you up so you can take care of yourself. Oh, you know. Self-sufficient, but God-dependent. Amen. Amen. That's hard. They got to go. They got to move across the country. That ain't easy. What about a faithful church member who is adored by all, but is called to full-time missions in another country? That ain't easy for that separation. Everybody loves them. They love everybody. But God has said, just like with Paul, separate me now. A best friend is promoted of the Lord to head up a new branch in another state. See, these are the hard separations that have to happen at the harvest. Because if you're really going to have a harvest, there's going to have to be some separation. Amen. And I'm ending with this. That was the last scripture in Acts. And I'm going to end with this. Loyalty is an awesome character trait. I love loyalty. Matter of fact, that's one of the things that I look for uh, on a leadership team. If you flighty 
and you have reservations about where you're supposed to be and about who you're under, I ain't, I ain't got time with you on the leadership level. But if you've got loyalty, amen, you can get it. Just like Jesus did. The, remember, the, the 70 didn't get what the 12 did, and even the 12 didn't get what the 3 did. Amen. amen. Loyalty is an awesome trait to possess. Listen, as long as you don't let loyalty get in the way of destiny. As long as you don't let loyalty get in the way of destiny. You are to go where you are sent and you are to stay where you are stationed. Some will be assigned to this post for a lifetime here. But some of you guys, you'll be here as long as I'm here. And others, they will come and go. But listen, but in accordance to the next God-given assignment, not just, I didn't like that message and I don't agree with that point, I'm out of here. Preacher didn't say hi to me this morning. I'm gone. I didn't like that song. I heard somebody talk about that song and they playing that song. I'm out of here. Amen? Can I be honest with you about something too? There's already been people that's come in and out of here because they don't because they don't line up with our core values that we have here. One of the things that God has sent us to do is break the back of racism in this area. And there's some that's come in this place and come out of that place because they can't handle that. But that's okay. Let them keep stepping. I know what God has sent us to do. Amen. The kingdom is beautiful. Amen? Because we're all brothers and sisters under one blood. Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. And that's why we do what we do and how we do it. Everything gets filtered through diversity around here. They couldn't handle it. I've had some people to come and go out here because they can't handle the working of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I don't want to just talk about him. I want to experience him. And Jesus is right now sitting on the throne. And the only way you're going to experience Jesus is through the Holy Spirit which is God the Spirit. Hello. Amen. And so he's welcome in here at any time. So some will come and go for reasons that's just petty. Let them come and go. But it's going to be hard when those that are going to leave from among us because maybe God has something for them. They come in, got what they needed to do. They come in, they got reaped out of the old environment. They come in and they got sheathed into a new environment, but they still had junk on them. Then they come in here and they collect that word, thresh them every week to start purifying them and start breaking out of their shell. And then all of a sudden they get winnowed and all that little light fluffy stuff that has no volume gets blown out of their life. And we all sick because we can contest to it. Brother got it going on now. Sister, she's a powerhouse in the kingdom now. I'd let sister so-and-so pray for me anytime. And then the Lord would want to plant them somewhere. That's going, to be, that's going to be tough on me, amen, as a pastor. That's going to be tough, especially when you love them. But I'm one under authority, amen? And this is his house. Amen. And those are his children with his plans. And I just need to be grateful that I was a part of their process, a part of their plan, and a part of their destiny. Amen. amen. Those are the hard separation. And as Jesus said, not my will but thine be done. So if you truly want to fulfill your purpose and your destiny, don't let loyalty get in the way of your destiny. Allow the Lord to take you through this process of separation. Because separation is sanctification. And separation can be suffering. But if there's no separation, there's no sowing. And if there's no sowing, there's no success. 